Good morning. It's lovely to see you all this morning. I hope that you're keeping safe and well. If you're visiting with us uh, today or you're joining us on the live feed or even watching the service later on, um, it's our sincere hope that you will be moved by the Holy Spirit at this time to share with us in worshipping the Lord our Lord. One or two intimations. No, just one or two, honestly. You should have the intimation sheet when you came in. I'm afraid that I have to begin our intimations this morning by announcing the recent death of Mrs. Margaret Rawson in Bachweeden Cable. Uh, Margaret was a member of our church and I believe at one time was actually a church officer in this very building. I have no more funeral arrangements uh, to give you, so if, if you want to know more, perhaps speak to more aggravating. Uh, there will be an online reflection at quarter past two this Wednesday, followed by the friend at half past two, uh, which the speaker will be Jim Anderson. And again, anyone who has teddies for Malawi, could you bring them to church uh, for the beginning of February? And many thanks to those who have knitted them. A reminder too that Irvin and Kilmarnock Presbytery is holding a high year ministry conference at Cape Park Church in Kilmarnock on Saturday the 19th of February between 10 in the morning and 3 in the afternoon. Um, if you want to go along and hear what the mission pioneers have been doing this year and plan for the future, or if you want indeed to be involved, um, then you're very welcome to go along. Uh, the event costs £10, which includes uh, lunch. And if you want more information about this, please speak to more. A change of date for some diaries to, uh, for the GIP session meeting, uh, to allow them to meet in person. The date of the meeting has now been changed to Wednesday the 2nd of February, half past seven, in the Poetry Hill Mission Centre. Please email more uh, if you wish anything added. I'm pleased to let you know that as of next Sunday, we are allowed to share in tea and coffee again at the end of the service. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing you all there next Sunday for a cuppa and a leather. Those are all the invitations. So come all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, listen, that you might live. So let's come before our God this morning and worship Him as we stand and sing from the church hymnary number 159, Lord for the years.
Lord, we lift up our heart to you in love and adoration. And we praise you for your greatness. You are the great and mighty King, and all glory belongs to you. Words cannot describe how awesome you are, and, and there is no other to be compared to you, no other who is high. We're filled with joy, and our spirits soar when, when we realize that we are in your presence. You alone are worthy of all our praise and worship. You are the only one who is just, holy and pure, whose words are trustworthy and true. Lord God, you have poured your love into the world, a love that is without equal, a love that costs you so dearly. Yours is a love that pierces the darkest of nights, a love that lights up our path as we follow you. You long to hear our praise, you long to hear our songs of worship, and for us to come that little bit closer to you. So inspire us today, inspire us to feel your presence and be touched, to hear your word and be moved to see your Spirit's work in our midst and be encouraged. When you are a gracious and merciful King, you're ready to forgive your children when we sin against you. You never turn your back on those who seek your kingdom, always welcoming with open arms those whom we sometimes fail to love. Forgive us, Lord, when we ignore those folks that you send to our door. Forgive us when we reject the authority of your word, when we fail to be your church in our community, and when we bring shame to you before our family and our friends. Lord, we celebrate these times when we share together Times when we can laugh, times when we can smile and be happy, times when we lift our voices and sing for joy before your throne. And as we still our hearts to listen and to praise your name, we come again to rejoice with you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one who gave us physical life, the one who gave us new life and the one who leads us to eternal life. Be close to us now as we come to pray with one heart and one voice, saying together the words we were taught to say, as we say, Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, my young friends, are you going to come up and join me on the red carpet? something to do with how we see things. Okay? So, 
if you wanted to see something that was really far away, what might you use? Yes. Binoculars. That's right. You might use binoculars. You can hold them. Do you know how to use binoculars? Right. You look up the back and see if you can see any faces. It's kind of heavy. However, <laughs> 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 if you drop them, it won't matter. So don't you worry about that. You look up the back. Can you see anyone? Yes. yes. That's good. So when you use binoculars, I know it's quite frightening, isn't it, when you see up the back? But when you use binoculars, it helps you see things that are far away. What happens if you turn them around? Turn them around and look the other way. <laughs> How far? They're far away. How far away are they? I know. Binoculars are great for seeing things that are far away, but only if you use them the right way around. So, what might you use if you want to see something that's really small? <laughs> you nearly said it. A magnifying glass, that's right. It just so happens that in here I have a magnifying glass. You need to hold that one, right? Now, if you look at your hand, does it make your hand look bigger? It does. Okay. Why don't you try looking up the back of the church with your magnifying glass? Does it work? <laughs> Can you see what I'm doing? No, no, they're all fuzzy. Magnifying glass helps you see, but it only helps you see really small things. It's not any good for things that are big. Okay, so we've got binoculars, we've got far away, magnifying glasses for things that are small. What happens if you need to read something very clearly, but it's out of focus a bit? What might you wear to help you see clearly? Glasses. Yes, glasses. Now, I've got glasses on. These are mine. But these are my wife's, and I can't see a thing. <laughs> I really can. Oh, would you like to hold your glasses for your mom? Now, my wife says that she can't see beyond the end of her nose without her glasses, and I think she's right. Is that good? Oh, yeah, good terrible. Glasses are good for seeing things in focus, but they only work for one person. Okay, the of these glasses are just slightly different, so they really only work for one person. I'll just put these back on them so I can hear them. There we go. Do you ever notice that? You can't hear properly with them. That's strange. Right, last thing. If you don't want to see something, what might you put on? Wipes. You could put a wipe on with that. Okay. What else might you use? A face mask. You could use a face mask if you pulled it up over your eyes. But there is something that you can get that helps you to not see things. And some people wear them when they go to bed at night because they don't want to see any light. They love the light <laughs> Oh, yes. That's right. A sleeping mask. And a blindfold. Again, this is mine. Do you want to put this one on? No, I don't think you would. Okay, so when you put this on, you can't see anything. You all still here? Yes. No, you're awake. <laughs> oh, I'm awake. Yes, but I'm awake. All of these things help us to see things differently. So the binoculars help us see things that are far away. Magnifying glass helps us see things that are really, really small. The glasses help us to focus and to see clearly. And the sleep mask or the blindfold stops us from seeing anything. Now, James says that it's really important that we see everybody just the same. And that we don't see some people as more important than others. So if somebody came in that had fancy clothes on, really expensive looking clothes and jewellery and you gave them the best seat in the church who's the best seat in the church? 
But then we do. We gave them that seat. And then someone else came in who was a bit dirty looking, maybe even a bit smelly. And we told them, well, you need to go and sit at the side of the way out the back. That wouldn't be fair, would it? We'd be saying that those two people are different. How you look at people matters. How God looks at people is really important because when he looks, he sees that everybody is just the same. Sometimes when we look at people, we look at them through binoculars, don't we? We want to see them as far away as we can. We don't want to know them. Sometimes we look at them through a magnifying glass and so that we see all the faults, all the things that we get wrong, we see them really closely and it looks really big. Sometimes we borrow someone else's glasses so that we can't see very clearly at all. And other times we look at people with a blindfold on, because we just don't want to see them. God says it's important that we see everybody just the same, in the same way that he sees all of us just the same. It doesn't matter if we're old or young, if we're bald or hairy, if we walk with a limp or we run and jump. It doesn't matter. God sees us all the same. And it's important that we do that too. Okay? Get your things back in the bag and you can go back to your seats just now. Thank you very much for your help. That was very good. And as we go back, we'll all join together and sing a song now that reminds us a wee bit about how we are all together. It's number 204 in the church anyway, called I Am the Church, You Are the Church.
mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, I appeal to all of you, my brothers, to agree in what you say, so that there will be no division amongst you. Be completely united with one another and one purpose. For some people from Chloe's family have told me quite plainly, my brother, <coughs> that they are quarrel among you. Let me put it this way. Each one of you who says something different, one says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Peter, and another, I follow Christ. Christ has been divided into groups. Was it Paul who died on the cross for you? Was he baptized as Paul's disciples? I thank God that I have not baptized any of you, except Crispus and Gaius. No one can say that you were baptized as my disciples. Oh yes, I also baptized the Barnes and his family, but I can't remember whether I baptized anyone else. Christ did not send me to baptize. He sent me to tell the good news, and to tell it without using the language of human wisdom, in order to make sure that Christ's death on the cross is not robbed of its power. For the message about Christ's death on the cross is not only to those who are being lost, but for us who are being saved, it is God's power. The scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and set aside the understanding of the scholars. So then, where does that leave the wise or the scholars or the skillful men, the agents of this world? God has shown that this world's wisdom is foolishness. For God, in his wisdom, made it impossible for people to know him by means of their own wisdom. Instead, by means of so-called old message we preach, God decided to save those who believed. Jews want miracles for proof. The Greeks look for wisdom. As for us, we proclaim the crucified Christ, a message that is offensive to the Jews and nonsense to the Gentiles. For those whom God has called both Jews and Gentiles, this message is Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. But what seems to be God's foolishness is wise, wiser than human wisdom, and what seems to be God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Now remember that what you wear, my brothers, when God called you, from the human point of view, you were wise, or powerful, or of high society standing. God purposely chose that the world considers nonsense in order to shame the wise, and he, should, he, and he chose what the world considers weak in order to shame the powerful. He chose what the world looks down on and despises and thinks is nothing in order to destroy that what the world thinks is important. This means that no one can boast in God's presence, but God has brought you into union with Christ Jesus, and God has made Christ to be our wisdom. By him we are put right with God. We become God's holy people and are set free. So then, as the scripture says, whoever wants to boast must boast of what the Lord has done. Amen.
praise God again as we sing from the church hymnary number 561. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Seriously funny. Found missing. Original copy. Almost exactly. Pretty ugly. My favourite. Hot chilli. I love hot chilli. <laughs> In his first letter to the Corinthian church, Paul writes to the Christians about splits and divisions. 
He writes to them about the divisions that have appeared. And he tells them that a united church has no divisions. There are no divisive people, no distractions, and only one director. The reason I'm saying this is because in 1 Corinthians, we find another example of an oxymoron. And that is a divided church. A divided church is an oxymoron. Because once a church has become divided, it ceases to be a church. You see, the two, the two words are a contradiction. When a church becomes divided, it's no longer a church. It's just a group of people who have lost their way, they've lost their focus. Division, hostility, jealousy, aggression, anger, these things within a church demoralize and they discourage, don't they? They undermine the testimony of the church. And eventually, I suppose like an acid, they eat away and destroy the church. Now, we're all grown-ups here. And we all know that arguments and disagreements and quarrels are part of everyday living, aren't they? The world is full of people fighting and arguing. We are surrounded by disagreement and division. And from time to time, some people seem to regress and become like children again. They behave as though someone's taken their toys away. Because children fight and quarrel. That's just a fact of life. That's part of who they are as they grow up. They argue and they fight. But of course you should expect them to grow out of that as they mature. But sadly, some don't. And the thing is, when we think about it, actually, the cause of much of the fighting and quarreling in the world, it's the same reason. It's the same cause. It's selfish nature. It's the me syndrome. It's all about me, and it's all about what I want and what I need. That's the world around us. And unfortunately, Christians and the church are not immune to these problems either. It's like a story I, I read once uh, uh, about a man who had been marooned on a deserted island for 20 years. Eventually a ship was sailing near the island and, and someone on the ship saw the man waving and jumping up and down on the beach. And they came ashore to rescue him. And when the ship's crew arrived, they looked around and, and, and they were amazed at all the buildings the man had constructed while they'd been buried. And they asked him, what are all these buildings for? And so he took them on a tour. He took them on a tour of his island. And as they walked down the street the man had made, he showed them this house, he showed them his shop, and with more than a little pride he pointed to the gym that he built, and to the pub, that's the pub over there. And as they went a little bit further down the street, the man showed him the church that he built for worship on a Sunday morning. The sailors were amazed and, and they looked around and, and, and then they saw this other grand building that the man had mentioned. And so they asked him, what's that building there then? And he said, that building was the church I used to go to before I got into an argument and left. <laughs> Christians in the church are not immune to quarreling. As commentator 
who wrote about this morning's passage, he said, quarreling is a reality in the church because selfishness and other things, sins are realities in the church. But because of quarreling, the father is dishonored. Because of quarreling, the son is disgraced. His people are demoralized and discredited. And the world is turned off. Now, as you know, I'm sure the church in Corinth had quite a few problems to deal with. But it's interesting that the first problem Paul deals with is this issue of quarreling and division. Because Paul realizes that while there is no unity within the church, nothing else will be accomplished. He recognizes that a divided church is in fact an oxymoron. So he writes in verses 10 to 17 about coming together, about not having any divisions asking them to be united in every way. Someone has told them that there are quarrels among them, that they're following different teachers. Some are following him, Paul. Some are following Apollos. Some are following Cephas or Peter. And some follow only Christ. Then he asks them, he says, is the church divided? Is Christ divided? Who was crucified for you? In whose name were you baptized? And in this warning, Paul is telling them that exactly what a united church should look like. He says, firstly, there should be no divisions. Look at verse 10 again. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Paul tells us there can be no divisions if we want to be the church that God intends. He says, You must be united. You must be united in thought and purpose. And you must understand what your purpose is. It's like, friends, the church is not a social club. The church is not a community centre. The church is not simply a building where we meet on a, a Sunday morning. Paul says that they, and of course us, we are the church. We are the church, and there can be no divisions among us. It's like the story of the king of Sparta in ancient Greece. He boasted that the, the mighty walls of Sparta would defend them. And one time an important visitor came by, and the guest looked around and, and well, he couldn't see any of the walls. Where are these walls? Finally, he said to the king, Show me these mighty walls of Sparta. And the Spartan ruler pointed to some obviously well trained soldiers, a mighty army, and he explained, There they are. There are the walls of Sparta. And just as each Spartan soldier was viewed by that king as a brick, in this mighty wall, so we are viewed by God as the bricks of his church. You know, we already know that the church isn't the building. It's not the fabric, it's not the structure. It's not the place that we need to worship. We know that the church is the body of believers. It's the people. We are the church. We are the walls of God's church. And sadly, when divisions occur, the walls of the church begin to crack and they begin to crumble. 
when we become divided, we forget who we actually belong to. When you share your life with Jesus, you no longer belong to yourself. You belong to Christ. And it's when you forget who you actually belong to that the visions occur. We are divided when we forget who we are. We're divided when we forget that we represent God right here in this time. God is meant to be seen through us in this place, in this community. But when we forget that, things begin to fall apart. It's about me. It's about what I want. It's about what I need. When we start to think like that, the walls begin to crumble. So Paul writes there can be no divisions. And he says that we must be united in thought and purpose. But he also tells us that a united church can have no divisive people. If you look at verse 12, he says, one of you says, I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, and still another I follow only Christ. Chloe has told Paul that the church was becoming divided and that these were the conflicts. These are the divisive people in the church. And we don't know exactly why these people were forming their cliques. But one group was saying that they followed Paul, another was saying that they followed Apollos. But do you see the pattern here? Well, we don't know why they followed the cliques. But the pattern is that they were all following a man. They were all following a human being. They were following an individual and that individual's teaching instead of following God. You might have noticed how some people identify the church they go to by saying, oh, that's the church that so-and-so is the minister of. Yeah, I go to so-and-so's church. It's as though who the minister is defines the church. And the problem with that is that we forget that the church actually belongs to God. It doesn't belong to any individual, not to the minister, not to the teacher, not to the church session or the leadership team, or any other person for that matter. The church belongs to God, and, and anyone who wants to follow a man or a woman instead of God are people who are causing division. That's why Paul's rebuking them. He says, stop following an individual and start following God instead. Because when you do that, when you follow someone and not God, you're being divisive. You're causing division. You're not unifying, you're dividing. And you need to stop. Now you might have noticed in that passage that there's also a group who are following only Christ. And at first glance, certainly I would think that's the group that I want to belong to. After all, I've just said that we should be following God. Well, that's true, we should be following God. But while Paul doesn't elaborate on this group, they're still part of the group. The groups that he lists as being divisive. Perhaps they're like the folks today who have no use for the leadership of the church, the leadership that God has chosen. There are Christ-only groups out there who, who only want to study and live by the four Gospels. If Jesus didn't say it, then it's irrelevant. Unfortunately, these can be some of the most divisive of all groups because they have no use they have no respect for the governance of a church. They have no use of respect for the leadership of God's church, as we find it in the scriptures. And it's likely that this Christ-only club 
had no respect for the leadership of the church in Corinth. God places leaders within our church. And as long as they're being true to Scripture, as long as they're following God's direction, it's our responsibility to follow these leaders. So Paul is simply saying that these factions are causing division within the congregation. And of course that's a warning to us too, a warning to be on our guard and not become part of a group that might divide the church. We're called to be unifiers. We're called to unify, not divide. And those who divide have no place in God's church. So Paul goes on to say that if the church is going to be a united church, there must also be no distractions. Verse 13, Paul says, is, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? He says there must be no distractions. Because distractions come in all shapes and sizes. I don't know if you remember, there was a film a few years ago, uh, Robin Hood. And Kevin Costner played Robin Hood. Do you remember? Do you remember the film? Well, there's a scene where Robin Hood comes up to a young man who's taking aim at a target with a bow and arrow. And he asks the boy, can you shoot without being distracted? And just before the boy lets go of his arrow, Robin pokes his ear with the feather of an arrow. And of course the boy misses the target and uh, there's lots of laughter at his expense. But after the laughter dies down, they admire and ask Robin Hood, well, can you do that? Can you aim without being distracted? So Robin Hood raises his bow, he takes aim, and just as he fires the arrow, they admire and blows in his face, and the arrow missed the target by a mile and nearly hit somebody in the crowd. Distractions come in all shapes and sizes. And whether they're painful or whether they're pleasant, the result is always the same. We miss God's mark. We miss the target when we're distracted. And Paul's saying to the Corinthians that they will miss their mark too if they fuss and fight about things that are not important to God. We can be quite good at fussing and arguing over things, you know, the kind of things that we argue about in church. What colour should the carpet be? Who moved the lectern? It's been in that place for 20 years. Why is the piano on the side of the chancel? The morning service has been in quarter past 11 for as long as I can remember, and the world will stop if we change it. Paul says that all of this is a distraction. And really we need to focus on what the church is supposed to be. Finally in verses 14 to 17, Paul writes that the church has to have one directive. He says, if you look at these verses again, 14 to 17, Paul tells them that apart from one or two folks, he didn't generally baptize me because he wasn't sent to baptize. He was sent to preach the gospel. Paul says that God didn't send him to create a clique or a group or a cult. We were not meant to follow him. We weren't meant to follow anyone else. Only God. And Paul's directive from God was to preach the good news of Jesus. And if the church, he says in Corinth, continued to follow a man or a particular group, then eventually what Jesus did on the cross will lose its power. The church will just become a 
another state, another cult, another group. We've just become a faction where people follow the lead of a human and not God. That was the case as Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. The church today, our church, should have one directive. And that is to spread the good news of Jesus. That is what a united church looks like. Although Paul doesn't actually use the word oxymoron, he does tell us that that's what a divided church is. He says that a united church has no divisions, there are no divisive people, no distractions, and only one directive. The thing is, could it be that God is speaking to you this morning about the unity of the church and your place in that church? Is he challenging you to accept the good news of Jesus? Is he asking you to focus and stop being a distraction or stop being distracted? Does he want you working to unite and not divide this church? This idea of it being all about me, all about the individual, is what causes so much problem in the church. We, friends, are united together. We are the ones who make the wall of God's church. And there can be no divisions, no divisive people, no distractions, and only one directive. Let's pray. Father of God, we thank you for your presence here in this place. We thank you for your direction. We thank you that you help us to be united in one faith. Now we ask that this be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. For the glory and praise are yours now and forever. Amen. We sing again from the church hymnary, number 180. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Number one, I'm going to need it.
walks with us day by day. We offer you not only our thanks for your love, but our money and ourselves. We thank you for the kindness you show us and, and for the blessings you bestow. We ask for God that you would bless these our offerings and, and use them and us to further the work of your church here in this place and beyond. Father, for the grace you show us, even when we turn away, that you give power to our faltering words, that you share your love with all your children, that your grace has come and walked the path that we follow. For all of this, we offer you our thanks, Lord God. For the good news that salvation has come to the earth, for your love, undeserved but graciously given, for the Holy Spirit transforming and empowering lives, for your promise of an eternity in which to praise you, Lord, we give you thanks. The God of mercy, we pray today for those who seek their Saviour, for those who seek the one who brings freedom and forgiveness. We pray for those who are in search of assurance, in need of forgiveness and grace. And so we bring before you those who long for wholeness, those who long for healing and peace, the folks for whom tomorrow will be a struggle. Those for whom just getting out of bed will be an achievement. The folks who will find their morning commute exhausting. And those who know that their day's work will be an effort. Oh Heavenly Father, we pray for those whose hearts are troubled, for those whose spirits are crushed, whether it be by sin or circumstance. Lord, deliver them from their difficulties. Bring healing, wholeness of mind, of body and spirit. Allow them to be the person that they were always meant to be. Bless those who mourn the death of a relative or friend. Those who feel that with this loss their lives are now incomplete. As those who have empty hearts, heal their brokenness. Let them feel the soothing balm of your gentle touch and know your peace. So Lord, we pray too for all those lives that have been touched by tragedy, whether by accident or by a deliberate act. Immerse them in your love and lead them through this darkness into your arms and into your perfect light. The word of grace to you, we bring our heartfelt prayers, for we know that you are a lamp that shines on a world that is searching. We know that you are the food that sustains a world that is hungry. You are the hope of release for a world that suffers. You are the one who restores a world that is broken. You are the one that forgives a world full of hate. And so to you, Lord God, this morning we bring our thanks and praise. Bless the hands that bring wholeness to the sick. Bless those who work in sad and desperate places <coughs> to bring a sense of hopefulness Father, bless our brothers and sisters, those facing daily opposition, the peacemakers working in hazardous conditions, the politicians who make decisions that affect us all. Bless the words and actions of those who carry your light into places shrouded in darkness. And bless your children, whoever they might be, with the warmth of your love and grace. For as the psalmist prays you, so too do we. We will pray 
Israel, Lord, among the nations. We will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Amen. We close our time of worship this morning as we stand together and sing number 392 from the church of the When I surveyed the wondrous cross. Rest and remain with each one this day and forevermore.